All right. Um, if you haven't done so, you can go ahead and turn in your Bibles or on your phone or your pad to the book of First Peter. We're in chapter 2. We're continuing from what Clayton taught us uh, on last week. Uh, this week, two verses. Two short verses, but powerful verses. Verses 11 and 12. So go ahead and turn that uh, to there for now, but you know, it's been pretty much impossible, or it is pretty much impossible to not know what's going on in the Middle East right now. We've been praying about it here in church. It's on the news, it's top of the headlines if you're scrolling through the headlines. Israel at war with a terrorist organization, Hamas, other organizations getting involved possibly, other nations involved, all starting on October 7th, a date that we're going to remember because of the barbarity and the slaughter that occurred on that day when Hamas attacked. The details are horrific. Imagine a lot of you have seen some of the details there's really only one word for all of this, and that word is evil. Now, there are a lot of theories as to why Hamas did this, but in the end, at this point, Israel is now doing what it believes is its only response. It is going to war. Along the way, it's likely to pull in other groups, as I said. We hear about Hezbollah. We hear about Iran, other countries. We see protests welling up across the world. And so certainly there is another gruesome war brewing in the Middle East with Israel's enemy's goal to eliminate that nation. Now, while there is a war going on, there is another war that we are going to talk about this morning. A war that has been raging since Adam and Eve sinned. It may seem a little crass to use the Israeli war as an introduction for the war that Peter describes, but maybe not. Yes, there are people dying. There are people being hurt, maimed. There are families being separated, people tortured, held hostage. But the war that we will discuss is one that rages within each believer's heart with an enemy that fights our spirit-indwelled soul. It is an eternal war that is fought on spiritual grounds. And the consequences are severe. They go beyond just ourselves even. We can't just hold it within ourselves. The consequences extend around us. Allow the enemy to take ground And we sin against an infinite, holy God. But, at the risk of violating an important principle of a good sermon, let me give you the punchline for this now. The war that I am talking about, that rages in each of our hearts, that war has already been won. This is what's different than the war happening in the Middle East. That war is ongoing. We don't know who the victor will be. But the war in our hearts, we know. I know, so I violated the rules, so clearly this is going to be a bad sermon, and you can go ahead and check out because you know, you know the end. But I don't know about you, I don't want to feel like I'm constantly losing the war. The battle. I know that we win, but I want to live life like a victor each day. Now, the life of a victor does not look like what the world says life looks like for victors or heroes. It looks different, but what does it look like? Well, that's what we're going to study today as we look through these two verses. So, Let me read them to you now, and please follow along. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passion of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. 
Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you so much for this book that we are working our way through, Lord, the truth that it contains. Lord, thank you for your spirit revealing that truth to our hearts, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that you would just use the words that I say now for your glory. Father, I, I need you. I need your help to say the things that you would have me to say. Father, I pray that you would use the truth of this word to encourage us and to convict us, Lord. Help us to grow in sanctification, Father. Lord, we praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, so uh, with two verses, I'm going to go ahead and divide this sermon up into two points, okay, for each verse. In verse 11, what we see is the internal war that rages in our flesh. That's verse 11, and that is going to be the first point that we talk about. In verse 12, we see the outworking of that war, the outworking of that war. So that will be verse 12. So because we have two short verses, we're going to go through these in detail. So I hope you can uh, follow along with me um, that I'm clear, uh, and let's put our thinking caps on. So we see in the first word of verse 11 that Peter is getting his reader's attention. You see, this isn't the beginning of the, the letter. This isn't the salutation. We're in the middle of the letter at this point. It's kind of like you're having a conversation with someone, and in that conversation you say their name, Okay. Well, they know you know who they are. You're talking to them. But in the middle of that conversation, you speak their name. So if I'm talking to my wife and I want to make sure she hears something I'm saying, I'll say Shane and then keep going because that that kind of gets her attention. It, it, It focuses her to what I'm saying. As we heard last week, then, Peter has proclaimed their identity as living stones who make up the church with Christ as their cornerstone. A holy nation, a chosen people, a royal priesthood. He reminds them that once they were not his people, but now they are his people. Once they had not received mercy, but now they have received mercy. And they are redeemed. But now he gets their attention. And we see that when he says, I urge you. This phrase gives us the idea that, again, there is an important point that he is making. So he grabs her attention, I urge you, because he's about to make a statement of fact that they need to understand. But before making that statement, Peter points again to their identity. But instead of going back to just a few verses ago, he now goes back to the beginning. So I'm going to read to you the beginning of this letter again, and you'll see how these relate. The beginning said, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ, and for sprinkling with His blood, May grace and peace be multiplied to you. So, Peter's use of sojourners and exiles in verse 11 brings the audience back to the introduction where he reminds them that they are elect exiles. Yes, they are a chosen people, but they're chosen for a purpose and they are not, they're exiles, so that this is not their land. But God has chosen them to be there for redemption and for grace. Now, he also uses the word sojourners here, which is interesting because he's reminding them that this is not their home. They're there temporarily. They're a traveler. Okay, They're, they're passing through. They are sojourners. 
They have a permanent home that is awaiting them. So he reminds them of their identity because he has a hard thing to tell them. He has to keep pulling them back to who they are. And what he tells them is that they must abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Now, let's put ourselves in the shoes of Peter's audience. They're living in an area where it is really not popular to be a Christian. In fact, they are subject to persecution. They see a war going on around them as they suffer a physical war because they're being persecuted. They have to be so careful about how they live. And now Peter, though, is telling them there is another war to wage. A war that exists in their soul. A war of their passions against the spirit-indwelled soul that they have. Well, if we think about their circumstances, this this really isn't a surprise. And the reason that they're under persecution is because they live in an amoral society. But they themselves are called to live according to a moral standard that is set by God. And so they live lives that convict the people around them. It is an affront to those people, an offense. And so, of course, there's a physical war of persecution and suffering that they are engaged in. But also the temptations of that society are all around them. The temptations inflame the war that rages within. So while there is persecution and suffering physically that is happening, Peter speaks first to what's happening within their soul. That is the reality he wants to speak to. It's the more important message. And in that message, Peter urges them to abstain from the passions of the flesh. Now, for those of you who are particularly skilled like I am at self-delusion, let's talk about this word abstain, because I tell you, I was trying to think of ways to kind of get around that word. Not sure I like the word abstain, but if I think about it, I have to admit there is a reality here. Abstain means to restrain or prevent oneself from enjoying or doing something. When we use the word abstain in our common colloquium, we think about things like abstaining from alcohol, abstinence. We think about abstaining from sex. Common refrains that we've heard, especially in the Christian world. For the unmarried people, we tell them to abstain from sexual relationships before they are married. There is no wiggle room there. We say that abstinence means no sexual relationships. No room for getting around that command. No flexibility for alcoholics. If they go through a program where they are called for abstinence, they are told no alcohol, no addictive substances. Does this mean that it's okay to go have a drink or two every once in a while? No. Abstinence means to completely stay away from or completely restrain yourself from something. And so Peter tells them to abstain from the passions of the flesh because they wage war against their soul. And this is not a war that comes with a hopeful ceasefire This is not a war carried out according to Geneva Conventions. The passions of the flesh do not take prisoners when waging war against your soul. Kind of reminds us of what we've heard about what's going on in the Middle East, right? There is no other option in this war than to kill and destroy. In other words, giving the passion of your flesh even a little bit of ground means you're giving ground to sin. So, we think about what it looks like for Peter's day. What does it look like for our day and age? Well, I think we can all recognize some of the similarities between Peter's time and our time. Maybe we aren't quite as far along. We're not yet at the point where we're dealing with the same level of persecution physically. But unless God intervenes, maybe we'll get there. But while we aren't there yet, that doesn't mean the war against our passions, the war of our passions, of our 
flesh is not effective. You see, we live in a culture which is constantly at active war with our soul. Think about what I consider the isms in our society. I have a few of them. Some of these may come to mind right away. Materialism, secularism, humanism, postmodernism, fancy words for these ideologies that are very important. And there are others. When we think of materialism, that tells us that the material possessions that we have, our comforts, our entertainment is more important than spiritual realities. Secularism, it tells us that people's lives should be separated from religion. We see this in the, what's been called the rise of the nuns. People who do not identify at all with religion. We see this as people are offended by bringing any kind of religious activity into the public sphere. Humanism tells us that people become gods. We have rights. We get to determine our own identity. We're offended by a creator who tells us who we are. Postmodernism tells us there is no ultimate standard of truth. We get to make that up. This Bible, again, is offensive. These ideologies are at war with biblical truth, and it attempts to draw us away from truly worshiping God constantly. And so it is a war that we are at. And so Peter, Peter's call to the people in that age to resist the passions of the flesh are just as important as they are today. And so we move now to verse 12 and the second point, the outward result of this inward war. As this inward war rages in our flesh, there is an outward manifestation. Rather than giving the people three steps on how to fight the war, Peter reminds them that this war does not happen in secret. We, cannot, we should not fool ourselves to think that fighting sin within ourselves, that we can hide that and it does not impact the people around us. There is an outward manifestation. Amazingly, in the middle of the persecution that they suffer, Peter, Peter tells them to live honorably among the Gentiles. To be specific, he tells them to keep their conduct honorable. I think that detail is important, especially when combined with the next phrase, because we get a true understanding what Peter means by that. In the next clause, he tells the readers, the listeners, so that when they speak against you as evildoers. That's modifying this idea of conducting yourself honorably. So let's think carefully what this clause tells us about living honorably among the Gentiles. <clears throat> and to start this thought process, I want to share a bit of a story. It's actually a story that I've shared before, um, but I thought it, it fit well here. It was the story about the time when I was on a construction project. This is when we lived in New Hampshire. And we were, I was on this project for two to three years, somewhere in there. I did all the quality assurance type stuff, and so I worked with a construction crew uh, for this two to three year project. I thought that my good behavior would win over the heathens around me. I had this idea that if I lived an honorable life, then they would be friendly with me. And they were. We were friendly with each other. I was a nice guy. They were nice people. And I thought that because of the friendliness, that I could share the gospel when they asked me why I tended to be different. The last time I shared this story, that moment came and I failed. I failed. I thought, surely... I would give a gospel presentation, and in that moment, it would be non-threatening because I was a nice guy. I lived a good life, and so they would listen. See, I had this idea that living honorably, this idea that it meant being nice, that it meant having a good reputation, and I'm not saying that those are bad things, 
In fact, the Bible even tells us to, to live this way. We see in the qualifications even for elders that they are to be above reproach, self-controlled, respectable. These are certainly good things, but being nice, reputable people doesn't necessarily get us the moniker of an evildoer. In my situation, I was nice and respectable, but frankly, I really wasn't much different than the nice, respectable people around me. You see, I was applying a standard for honorable that the world had lulled me into believing was the correct standard. Be a nice little Christian who is lukewarm and doesn't really rock the boat at all. You know, in most situations, that doesn't look a lot different than the other people around you. The standard that Peter is referring to is God's standard. We are to live honorably before Him. Another way to think about that is that we are to live a life that is God-honoring, not people-honoring. This is where the outworking of the war inside comes to light. If we are not winning the war against our passions, we will live a life that is people-honoring. If we are winning the war, then we will live a life that is God-honoring. But how does the world see it? Well, if we're living a life that is God-honoring, they very well may call us evildoers. Now, I don't know about you, but that does not sound right. That that's, seems ironic, doesn't it? That we as a people who are, who are living a Christian life, who desire to follow the Lord, that we would be called evil. How can the world, which is evil, call Christians who are redeemed by a holy God evil? But if you think, I imagine you can come up with examples just a couple. How about abortion? A Christian who would profess that aborting the unborn is murder would be called oppressive and evil because the way the world sees it, that's a woman's right to her own reproductive health. A Christian who would say that there is justification for the death penalty based on the Noahic covenant would be called cruel and evil because the world would say that the convicted murderer has rights too. There are other examples, many more, many that are very fresh today. But in the day that people, Peter lived in, and in the day that we live in, living a God-honoring life will lead to the world calling you evil. Why? Because it does not like the way you are living your life or the standard by which you are living. But there is a great hope that makes all of those trials, those difficulties, those barbs that they shoot at us pale in comparison. You see, unbelievers will see your good deeds, the ones that they will accuse you for being evil. And on the day that Jesus returns, they will glorify God. Every knee will bow Every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And on that day, you and I will not be called evildoers. We will not stand with the defeated. No, we will stand with Jesus as victors. The passions of our flesh that fight against us are not worth the inexpressible joy we will feel that day when we are with Jesus. Jesus Christ. But let's look back at the wording of this verse again. Again, it's so important. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, honorable before God, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, now note the word when, they will see your good deeds. Those phrases are in the present tense. They will see your good deeds. It is in the future when they will glorify God on the day of visitation. But there is still hope now for those unbelievers. 
Yes, they will call us evildoers, but they see the good works. They see them now. And they will one day realize those good works are a testament to God's glory. Let's pray for them that the day they realize that is before God comes, that they might be redeemed. But that's also important because if our good works were just some evidence of goodness within ourselves, then we fall prey to thinking that we have earned those good works, that our suffering somehow justifies our own goodness. We know from Ephesians that God has prepared these good works beforehand that we should walk in them. Rather, the good works are wrought by God through us that He might receive glory from them. We have the privilege of participating in that God-glorifying act. The times that we plug ourselves back into the equation and say, oh yes, this is because of me, then those works become part of our own goodness. That's what we think. And we begin losing the fight against our passions because of our own pride. But keeping in mind that God is the source of our good deeds gives us the attitude that allows us to fight our passions for this brief time we are on this earth, that we might live in a God-honoring way. And so, what's the application of this text for us? Well, I can tell you what the temptation is in this text. The temptation is to, you know, to say that you need to do better. You need to fight. Be a good soldier, right? There's a, you know, I want to give a pep talk here, like the rah-rah kind of, kind of sermon. Maybe, you know, if we do that, you don't even walk away from here excited. Yes, we're going to fight the fight. But that kind of message and that kind of action will eventually fizzle. Or it could even lead to an awakening of a prideful spirit in our hearts. So rather than telling you that you got to be the best you you can be, or be a good soldier, or anything like that, I'm going to tell you to have courage. Now, that is not the same thing as telling you to fight to be a good soldier. You see, you can have courage and not fight. You can fight and not have courage. Having courage requires more than just living a good life. It requires that we apply God's standards to our lives. It requires that we take up our cross daily. It requires that we sacrifice our passions. It requires that we humbly call upon God to help us each and every day. So what does our life look like if we do not have courage? Turn with me to Revelation chapter 3. We're going to look at verses 15 to 19. This will probably be familiar for all of you. This is a one of the letters to one of the churches, one of the seven churches. I know your works. You are neither hot, neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either hot or cold or hot. So, because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich, and white garments so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. You see, the church of Laodicea had no courage. They lived a life that was nondescript, no different than the people around them. Their passions were winning the war against their soul, and they were giving into the materialism and the secularism and the humanism of the day. 
You see that in these verses. And God called them lukewarm. I tell you what, there is no other thing that I want to be called than lukewarm. Look at what God said. I will spit you out of my mouth. This is a picture of people who lacked courage. But we also see what it looks like to have courage. God tells us to see reality. If we repent and suffer His discipline... He will clothe us and cleanse our blindness. And when that blindness is removed, we will see that the passions and riches of the world lead to a poor and wretched state. True riches come from Him, gold refined purely by fire, white garments that take away our shame. So what does it look like to be courageous today? Well, a few examples, but let me say first that really the answer is for you. You need to ask yourself that, what courage looks like. But in order to ask, this is the first step, you must pray. Pray to the Lord. Ask Him to give you the courage to follow His will and fight the passions of your flesh. And I think as you pray that, you're going to find that it begins with you, yourself. For example, have the courage to make time to worship Him every day, all day. Make time to proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord. Make time to meditate on the Gospel. Make time to read and love His Scriptures. I can tell you that I struggle with this. For me, making time means sacrificing time. And it's so easy for myself to convince myself that all the other time of the day is more important. But that is my flesh whispering in my ear to give way to a lukewarm life. And I can promise you that in giving your passions to God, He will multiply that time that you have. It just takes courage to do so. And as you pursue God's will, you will find it has an impact outside yourself and it causes you to actually start looking the exile part. The courage to follow God's will will look in many different ways, such as speaking the truth in love. Not just having, you know, saying things bluntly and not caring about people. Not just avoiding hard conversations, but speaking truth in love. Courage looks like praising and thanking God openly. To boldly be thankful in all things. Courage looks like taking the time to care for orphans and widows. Courage looks like turning away from unwholesome worldly things and practicing spiritual disciplines. Courage looks like living the life of a sojourner who is not from this world. Courage looks like sharing the good news of Jesus Christ to those who do not believe. In closing... I want to read a quote to you from Alexander Solzhenitsyn. For those of you who do not know him, he was a Russian soldier during Stalin's terrible reign when millions of Russians were being slaughtered. He was caught up and sent to the Siberian Gulag where he stayed and suffered great persecution for multiple years. But... He lived through it, and he wrote many things about that black period of history. And so, this is one thing he wrote. This is about, this is about the nation that he lived in, okay? And I'm going to use it as a metaphor for ourselves. He said, The strength or weakness of a society depends more on the level of its spiritual life than on its level of industrialization. 
Neither a market economy nor even general abundance constitutes the crowning achievement of human life. If a nation's spiritual energies have been exhausted, it will not be saved from collapse by the most perfect government structure or by any industrial development. A tree with a rotten core cannot stand. You know, when I read this, my first thought went to Israel, and I thought about their state today. You see, Since its creation after World War II, Israel became a very technologically sophisticated society, but even its best espionage service did not protect it from what happened on the 7th. Reliance on their military, that's not what's going to save them. In some ways, you could say the nation is losing the war with its own passions. For as the psalmist said, we should not trust in horses or chariots, but in the Lord. But let me reread this quote from a personal perspective. If I did that, it would read something like this. The courage of a person depends on the level of his spiritual life and not on the level of success. Neither a good life nor even general happiness constitutes the crowning achievement of human life. If a person's spiritual disciplines have been exhausted, he will not be saved from defeat by the most perfect life or by any material abundance. A soul given to its fleshly passions cannot live a God-honoring life. Let me say that again. A soul given to its fleshly passions cannot live a God-honoring life. Now, we can have the confidence to know that God, through His indwelling Spirit, gives us the strength to fight the war against our fleshly passions. And in the process, we live lives according to His will that honor Him. Now, the world may call you evil for it. So I encourage you to pray each day for the courage to follow the Lord's will in your life. Worship Him. Give Him glory. Be courageous in Him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you again for your abundant grace, Lord. We need your abundant grace because in and of ourselves, we do not have the strength. We do not have the ability to fight our flesh. But Father, I thank you for the Spirit who indwells us. When we are redeemed, when we believe in Jesus Christ and confess our sins, when we surrender to you, Lord, and the Spirit comes into our hearts, we are able to fight the passions of our flesh. And it is not even that we are barely able. We are abundantly able. Because, Lord, You are so much greater. You are so much greater than the sin around us. You are so much greater than Satan and death. And one day it will be defeated and cast into the lake of fire and we will truly be victors. Father, I look forward to that day. Thank you so much for the hope that that brings. In your name, amen.